<clears throat> so, uh, for example, you know, and that's a good answer, but I, I think you've kind of expanded onto some things we'll talk about in just a minute. But for example, if I only know the terms and I know nothing about, uh, you know, their economical organization, who really brings, you know, most uh, calories or most food to the table or anything like that, or if I know nothing about that culture, if I know nothing, and I just know the terms in the foreign language that I never spoke before, just that information in and of itself will already tell me something about that society. And here's what I mean. And you've kind of mentioned that in your, I think earlier answers, what, um, you know, with every, with your position in the kinship structure or your position in culture in general and in the kinship structure specifically comes uh, rights and responsibilities, right? Uh, so, because you're someone's son comes with certain set of rights and responsibilities, because you're someone's father comes with a certain set of rights and responsibilities, right? Certain benefits, certain expectations, certain rules. So, <clears throat> depending, like I said, on your position, whether you're an older brother, a younger brother, uh, that means something in just about any culture. In some cultures, it means more than in others. And for example, this example that Kotak is actually talking about in some of the very first passages in this chapter, he said there is this ethnicity that's called Bastilio uh, on the island of Madagascar, right? This island off the coast of Africa. And there they have, for example, their mother, uh, father, sister, mother, sister. So these are the genealogical terms, like we talked about the genealogical types, I'm sorry, genealogical kin types is mother, father, sister, mother, sister. And then we have our kin terms. So they have one kin term for three genealogical kin types. So usually one kin term uh, can encompass as many as, you know, eight or 10 different genealogical kin types. If you look at a word like cousin, right, in English, a cousin can be a female cousin, a male cousin. It could be a son of your mother's brother. It could be a daughter of your mother's sister and so forth and so on. So if you look at this, you know, uh, kinship diagram that I have at the bottom. <clears throat> so basically, if this is me, the ego, this triangle here, cousins can be all of these, all of these people here. Uh, I'm sorry, not uh, not this one and not this one because this is my brother and sister, but these, the ones I'm pointing at right now, <clears throat> and these individuals here, they will all have one cultural kin term, cousin, but genealogical kin types will be different for each one of these. So this is uh, my father's <clears throat> brother's daughter. This is my father's brother's son. This is my father's sister's daughter. This is my father's sister's son. So as you can see, these are all different genealogical kin types, but there's only one cultural kin term. So that's the difference between these two definitions. And uh, <clears throat> by me knowing that this culture, for example, in Madagascar makes no distinction between this individual here that I'm pointing at right now, and then this individual here, and then this individual here, they're all called by the same name. So if a child is in one room and he says, Rainy, 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 come here. Any one of these three people will run into the room, right? So that tells me that in this culture, there is probably a similar set of rights and responsibilities that these three people have in relation to this one person who says the word rainy, okay? And Kotak, of course, goes on and says, look, this person who called them rainy, his father's sister, 
ended up raising him because his parents, I guess, died tragically or something like that. So, so she played the role of a mother. So that kind of makes sense that these individuals that he calls by the same name, they play the same role and they have the same sets of rights and the same sets of responsibilities, again, in relation to this person. Or they say Ray for father, for father's brother and mother's brother. So for these three individuals that I'm pointing at, they have the same term. Again, we can assume they have the same amount of rights and responsibilities. And these, um, you know, this dichotomy between cultural kin terms and genealogical kin types varies tremendously from culture to culture. Like for example, China, they have one of the most complicated uh, cultural kin terms because for just about every person, they have a separate term. Okay, like to know Chinese kinship, you need to learn like a hundred different words because this person will be one word, this person will be another word, this person will be another word. They rarely lump people together. Okay, and then there are some cultures like English speaking cultures. They lump all kinds of people together. Like if you look at the word cousin, it says uh, me and my cousin went to the zoo I mean, that could be a whole number of genealogical kin types. It could be a male, it could be a female, it could be a relative on your father's side, on your mother's side, and so forth and so on. So there are all these examples. <clears throat> and also, um, for example, you know, Kazakh culture, right? We talked about Kazakhstan already. Uh, to give you another example, they have a one word for an older brother in a different word for a younger brother. In Russia, we just say brother. We don't necessarily say, we may say, you know, my older brother, my younger brother, but that's not an ingrained part of that term, all right? With them, with just one word, he says, me and my brother went to the zoo. Right away, you know, was it your older brother or was it your younger brother? So for them, it's important to make the distinction right away. And it makes sense because their culture is very age sensitive. If you're older than someone else, that requires a different treatment. Even if you are a little bit older than someone else, you know, you're supposed to be sort of respected and revered more. Like in Russia, it's not a big deal if someone is three years older than me, you know, but in their culture, if it's your older brother, uh, you, you're supposed to treat him with an additional respect um, and who is older and who is younger plays a great role. For example, if they sit at the table at a traditional Kazakh house, who is supposed to sit where? If they say toast, who is supposed to say the first word? Who is supposed to say the second word? And if you violate that order, you will offend people. Okay, and their kin terms reflect that. Okay, who, who is older than me? Who is younger than me? They need to know that right away. <clears throat> so these are examples of uh, what I can say, or at least hypothesize by not knowing anything about that culture, but just by knowing kin terms, I can already start, um, you know, concluding something about this culture, or at least at the level of a hypothesis, what kind of relationships they have within their kinship structure. So let's move on to the next question. Um, can you guys read the next question if you have it? Either Vlad or Yana. Vlad, go ahead. Um, why is no, uh, why should an anthropologist investigate kinship? Yeah, so these, uh, yeah, good. Okay, and Vlad, you kind of talked about this already. But if you can kind of, uh, you know, add to your previous answer or maybe repeat some of the things that you've stated. Um, so I just, re I only can repeat. So first of all, we understand the relations, the power relations in family and in culture. So, uh, and from one hand, we can understand some parts of uh, rules of nutrition, of production, in that, uh, that culture. So, this my answer. Okay, 
Uh, Jana, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, I can just say that anthropologists, they focus on this uh, um, kinship calculation because, uh, for example, according to, to them, kinship is like culturally constructed and it can be, um, yes, it's culturally constructed, meaning that uh, relatives can be constructed genealogically or socially as a kin. So. Okay. So these are both good answers. And let me just uh, say a few words to kind of summarize what you guys have been saying, maybe add some additional things. So quite often when a cultural anthropologist arrives to a village, and like I told you before, these cultural anthropologists, they study small communities traditionally at the level of villages, right? They don't study these huge industrial societies. Let's say you arrive to the Trobrian Islands in the Pacific Ocean. One of the very first things that every anthropologist does is asks who is related to whom, and they construct this genealogical kinship uh, diagram. Okay, and uh, why is it so important for them to do that is because, especially when we're talking about pre industrial societies, kinship is a very important organizing principle. So people, you know, human beings, we're social animals, we live in groups and uh, we conduct all kinds of activities in groups. So by you finding out who is related to whom, you have a very basic blueprint on of what kind of groups these people are organized in, who is affiliated with whom. Because if it's a kinship group, you know, these are the people who probably party together. They exchange information on the daily or on the regular basis. They probably live next to each other. If you offend one of them or if you mess with one of them, you'll probably gain enemies from the rest of them. So those types of things are good to know, right? If you're a new person in the village. Also, these are the people who share resources. Maybe not on the regular basis, but if one of them is doing bad, they can always borrow from their relative. Like if you want to borrow money, first you go to your relative. So you understand these group dynamics right away. Like I said, these people probably live, live close to each other and stuff like that. Another thing that you understand is the economic organization. All kinds of different things about the economic organization of that entire community. Like I told you guys before, when we talked about crib, when you talk about uh, pre-industrial societies, your supervisor is probably your father if you're in a patrilineal society. Every day, you probably work with your relatives, with your kin. Like, you know, these people in this image uh, in the lower corner, right, in the lower left-hand corner, without knowing anything, I can tell you right away, they're kin, right? without knowing anything I could tell you. And these are all images from a Russian village, except of course for the Indian one. But you know, let's say you come to a Russian village in the 17th, 18th, you know, not even 19th century. Things like land ownership, you can only understand through kinship because these peasants, if you want to get more land or if you want to get any land at all, you don't just go and buy it because these peasants didn't have cash on their hands. Most of them, right, didn't have any cash. What they did, they worked on their plot and they paid a certain tax to Pamishik, for example, in the form of grain, right? So you can't just go somewhere to the city and buy a plot of land because you don't have any cash. All you have is your grain. So the only way you can get land is to inherit land inherit that land from your father, right? And uh, what position in the kinship structure you are will dictate how much land you will inherit, whether you're an older brother, where you, you're a younger brother, um, that will determine your land ownership. And that's not like that only in the Russian culture, but also in a lot of peasant cultures in Europe. You know, these, we know these fairy tales, for example, when the younger brother is always sort of this poor 
kind of person who has to struggle more and the older brother gets everything. So just by your virtue in the kinship system determines whether you're more or less wealthy, for example. When we're talking about house ownership, you know, again, these people didn't buy a new house. If you live in the Russian village and you want a new house, let's say you're a young man like Vlad, for example, right? And you want a new house. The only way you'll get a new house is if you convince all these people, all your relatives, to help you build a house, right? You go to your father, you go to your brother, you go to your cousins and you say, will you guys help me build my own new house? And they say, the only way we'll help you is after you get married. Because unless you get married, if you're just a single guy, no one's gonna build a house for you. They're gonna say, why would we waste all this time? You're not even married. Until you're married, you go ahead and stay at your father's house. So this kind of property house ownership is dictated by your position in the kinship structure. If you're a young woman like Yana and you live in the Russian village and you want to live in your own house, that's the only way for you to do that. The only way for you to move out of your father's house is to get married, is through marriage. Because if not, you can't just be a young lady living in your own little house. No one's gonna build you a house. You know, you only move out to your new husband's house or to the house of your husband's father. Uh, labor relations, I've already commented on that. So just again, by knowing the kinship structure, you understand all that. Uh, also, when we're talking about political structure, especially at these pre-state societies, marriage ties mean a lot. Even if you look at state societies like... Uh, kingships right not kinships but king kingships kingdoms marriages marriage alliances meant a lot and they influenced and dictated the political life of that territory so for example if a young russian czar you know in uh, in the 16th century if he married a german princess or a greek princess for example that affected greatly the diplomatic relationships between the Greece of that time and Russia of that time, probably in a favorable manner. Also that Greek princess brought with her members of her clan to Kremlin, to the Russian court. And these members of her clan had influence on, the, on Russian political life and on Russian diplomatic relationships with Greece even if it was, for example, if a Rus Russian czar took a Russian girl as a wife, this girl comes with a clan to Kremlin and her clan has a certain agenda and it consists of a lot of people. So these people, they instantly elevate to the top of the political elite and they start pushing their agenda forward and they start changing the politics of that country. So basically, uh, you know, kinship is an important factor to understand in these pre-industrial societies. And the example that I gave you with the Iroquois that you can see in this picture again, right? The Iroquois Indians of Northeast America. Until Europeans understood their kinship, they could not understand the political structure of these people. And they could not deal with them effectively politically because this clan structure was so strong. And for you to engage in any kind of negotiations or start influencing people, you need to understand this basic structure because if a clan mother, and that was a surprising thing for Europeans that it was a matrilineal society, you know, as warrior-like as these Native American Indians were, they were matrilineal, especially when it came to this clan structure, they had a clan mother at the top. And uh, whatever that clan mother says or advises or suggests her clan members to do, that mattered a lot in terms of, you know, uh, which way you could sway or push or convince these Iroquois Indians, especially in the wars that were going on at that time between uh, the colonial powers. Okay, so one more thing that you can understand by knowing the, the kinship structure is the rules and norms. Okay, so for example, who can you marry 
in the society? Who can you not marry in that society? Like I told you guys before, you know, in certain societies, marriage between cousins is normal. And in certain societies, it's strongly suggested or almost required. Like if you go to South India, especially in the recent past, uh, it was strongly preferred that you marry your cousin. And you cannot marry just any cousin. Let's say you're an Indian young girl or an Indian young man, and you know, you're in love with your parallel cousin. You can't marry your parallel cousin. But if you're in love with your cross cousin, you can marry your cross cousin. So by looking at this diagram, can you guys define what a parallel cousin is? And you, can you guys define what a cross cousin is uh, by, you know, kind of knowing what you know and these types of diagrams were in contact to describe their basic structure. So again, ego is you. This person in the middle is you. A triangle means a, a male. A circle means a female. The equal sign means marriage. And these straight lines downward mean children. So for example, this is me, this is my father, this is my mother, this is my sister, this is my brother. So why don't you guys look at this diagram for a few minutes and tell me the difference between a parallel cousin and a cross cousin. Oh, you know, how do we say high status from low status when we excavate graves is uh, we look at things that are included in the grave most of the time. So this, uh, not only one woman, but a number of women, because they've excavated close to 150 burials altogether. It's basically a huge site um, that's the size of about five football fields, right? About five hectares. And within that site, they excavated the cemetery. And within that cemetery, within the clusters, they started seeing women. And some of these women had a lot of grave goods, right? What's called grave goods included in the graves. And, uh, you know, one of these women that's sort of the poster child of this kind of, of this archeological site, they call her the princess of Hawk Phenom. They call her the princess because of how rich her burial is. Uh, you know, this burial included uh, pots, pottery, and not just any pottery, but very fancy, very beautiful, uh, beautifully made pottery, right? Included a bunch of that pottery. Then you can see on these uh, slides, on these images, uh, you can see her, you know, we can call it jewelry. Um, basically, like different bracelets. You see a bracelet here and you see a bracelet here. This is a picture of the same individual, just different color. Uh, you see her shoulder circular sort of ornaments that are right on her shoulders. Then like Vlad said, there was red ochre there too. And another thing that signified her high status were these beads. Beads are boosted, right? So beads, for example, there are 120,000 small beads made out of shell. You guys hopefully know what shell is, right? Uh, this is the cover of these marine animals like mollusks, uh, that's called a shell. So out of that shell, someone had to sit there and make 120,000 of these beautiful beads. Each one of them looked like a little disc, right? And this woman's clothes was all draped in these beads. So that tells you that a lot of labor went into making a dress for this woman. A lot of hours, a lot of people probably labored at this kind of stuff for a long time to just make sure that this woman is dressed in a proper way. And then her necklace, for example, contained a thousand shell beads of a different shape. They were not disc beads, but another shape that was also quite pretty. So these, this is the evidence of high status and uh, another interesting thing is that, you know, this association with pottery, uh, that not only pots, not only sort of the final product 
were present, but also some tools associated with making pottery. And Parker Pearson talks about that. For example, he talks about a burnishing stone. This is like when you make your pot and right before putting it in the fire, putting it in the kiln, you take a little pebble, a little rock, and basically rub your pot to make sure that it shines, to make sure that it's smooth. And this kind of uh, labor is called burnishing. This kind of activity is called burnishing. So there was this burnishing rock or burnishing implement there in the grave with her. That means she was probably involved in making actual pots. And there was also a clay anvil, uh, that's A-N-V-I-L, anvil, is a nakavalnya, right? Uh, so what they mean is uh, it was basically an implement used in pottery making also, because when you're making your pot, when you take a piece of clay, you don't want to just do it on the ground or do it in the dirt. You need some kind of a flat surface made out of stone. And uh, this kind of surface was present in the grave also. So these kind of you know, tools, they tell us that uh, this was probably a skilled potter. So this woman was probably a skilled potter. And that's something that we see from generation to generation. It's a kind of an interesting uh, sort of scenario in archeology span where these potter women uh, looks like where they occupy the high status. Uh, it's not something that we see often in archaeology, but it looks like that's what was going on at uh, this site, Hawk Phantom D, at least that's the prevalent hypothesis. Okay, so um, this is one of the major questions always. Was the status in this uh, society achieved or what we call ascribed? So achieved is something you achieve during your lifetime, right, through your experience through your skills, through your um, knowledge and strength, you know, these different personal qualities. And inherited, you know, obviously, it's also called ascribed often in archaeology. It's something that you get just by the virtue of your birth being born to certain parents. So what they see in this uh, society through looking at their cemetery, right? Remember, we're looking at this cemetery and there are different phases. Um, so there are quite a few burials. I believe they excavated uh, 150 burials altogether. So they start looking at these burials and you know they see that sometimes in a certain cluster, and we talked about how these burials are divided into clusters, <clears throat> there can be a woman who is uh, buried with a bunch of goods Right, and we talked about these goods can be like pottery and uh, jewelry in the form of shell beads and um, other fancy stuff, uh, other, you know, sort of jewelry like things like these plaques that are on the chest. And I showed uh, you guys the picture last time. Okay, so, uh, so next to these women, they find the burials of rich infants, right? So very small children, babies who are buried also with these fancy items. So these babies could not have reached uh, a high status during their lifetime because their lifetime was short, right? They couldn't have been like successful craftsmen or, uh, you know, leaders of the society or anything like that. Uh, so that kind of shows an ascribed status. But on the other hand, some of the later generations are buried, um, with no fancy goods. So let me just bring up this uh, slide here. And this is directly from your book, the one of the illustrations. <clears throat> and we'll be looking at this slide a little more uh, today. So the squares are children, the triangles are males, circles are females. So this is kind of similar to the kinship diagram that we looked at. Uh, but it is different. It's not, you know, th they don't use the same exact legend as the other chart. But at any rate, so for example, let's say, um, let me make my cursor visible. Give me just one second here. 
Okay, so let's say this woman, right, the circle here, this woman is very close to these children. And this woman and these children, they have fancy stuff. They have this beautiful pottery and jewelry and stuff like that. But then it, let's say two generations later, let's say there's one generation later, two generations later, these children that are clearly descendants of this woman, these straight solid lines indicate descent, ind indicate biological kinship. These children here are buried with no fancy goods. So people, you know, so overall, you know, the answer is correct. Vlad is correct in that the status is, uh, seems like it is achieved. Or in other words, the status, it can be lost or gained from one generation to another. It's not like a solid inheritance of status. And what uh, Parker Pearson calls it is a big man society. Big man society is like this term where basically the next generation has to fight for the status again and has to do some things uh, and has to be active, engage in certain activities or do whatever they have to do to gain the status again. So this kind of gauntlet for high status, it resets itself every generation. And you know, your next generation may be successful, may not be successful. Uh, you know, sometimes there is this consistency, you know, even if they look at this long sequence of burials, quite often they do see a consistency of, you know, a rich woman having um, children that are associated with her or her later generations also being rich, but sometimes they don't see that. So it's not, you know, as straightforward of a situation, but overall, you know, uh, we can say that the status was achieved in this society. The basic idea, right, if you look at this chart, <clears throat> that like there is a circle here and each circle is a generation or each level is a generation. <clears throat> a circle here, a circle here, a circle here. <clears throat> so that means that these women never leave the village, <clears throat> right? So a grandmother, a daughter, granddaughter, great grandmother and so forth and so on this huge line of people they're all buried in the same village so that means they never leave the village if it was the patri local society every time a woman gets married <clears throat> she leaves the village and goes to live in her husband's village as opposed to her own village so that would be patri locality so we wouldn't find all of this line of uh descent of women, right? However many generations, I believe altogether there are 20 generations. We wouldn't find 20 consecutive generations of women buried all in one village. <clears throat> so clearly women are staying in one village, right? And that's called matrilocality. A matrilineal society is a society where your lineage, your descent is traced through the maternal line. Right? Like we talked about in our Russian society, in traditional Russian society, we're a patrilineal society because you get your last name from your father. For example, if we always got our last name from our mother, we would be a matrilineal society. And uh, it's not necessarily that a woman in that society is the main sort of character, you know, like Yana said, or that a woman is in charge, not necessarily. Um, there could still be men, you know, as leaders in that society, it's just how they trace their lineage. So what they're saying is that this society is matrilineal, matrilineal. Um, so let's kind of try to verbalize this, you know, their argument, Parker Pearson's argument, uh, you know, and by looking at this chart again, why do we think that this is a matrilineal? Could this be a patrilineal society? Like what's the argument here for, for this society being matrilineal?
Does anyone want to try? Vlad, maybe? No. Uh, so, I mean, the argument is not so sort of clear here. I mean, metro locality, that's pretty clear, right? We can see that. But uh, matrilineal, I guess w what they're saying is, uh, look, you know, why are the children, for example, uh, buried with women? Why are they not buried with older men, for example? Well, first of all, we do see men here. Okay, we do see triangles here, which is important. But, for example, if we look at this chart here, so we go up to a woman, we go up here, and this line here is like a punctuated line. It's not a straight line, which Parker Pearson does not really give us the n detailed notation what that means. So I guess this, I'm reading it as this man could be from the outside. This is an outside man because we don't see any lines drawn from this triangle upward, right? Uh, so this could be an outside man. This could be, for example, a husband of this female. But the female is clearly related. We see a solid line to this other female. So looks like men come from the outside and sometimes they don't. But for example, in this case, we see a triangle that's definitely related to the circle. But this could be a case where this woman had no daughters and only had a son and therefore a son is acting as her, you know, descendant. Or maybe, uh, so you see, for example, a child here and, and a man. So maybe the, they had a, she had a daughter, but that daughter died as a child uh, and therefore left no female descendants. And therefore her line, sort of her last name is passed on through, through the man at that point through her son, for example, and he's buried in the cemetery. And so we can look at the cemetery as, you know, people of the same last name, you know, possibly that are, that are born. That would be our equivalent, easy for us to understand. So if these are people sort of of the same last name that are buried here, for example, if you look at First of all, these are separate clusters. This is like cluster one, cluster two. So let's look at this cluster. We see, you know, this female buried, this female buried, female buried, female, female. So we see all these generations with no males at all. So if this is a cemetery dedicated specifically to this descent, you know, specifically to this uh, last name, we see for many generations, no males present at all. So if, if a male is important to this descendants, right, to keeping track of this biological kinship, where are the men, right? For like seven generations, there are no men at all here. And when we do see men, they're either from the outside or they're in the situations where possibly there were no direct females, female descendants, and these males could have been like substitutes um, for the lack of any better choices. You know, if, I, if I'm a woman and I have no daughters, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to use this son as my descendant, you know, to pass down my last name. So that's kind of the argument. So, for example, if we look at this other instance here, like, you know, first of all, in both of these, the sort of, you know, clan mother, so to speak, or lineage mother, is always a woman, right? This, like the very earliest burial. So chronologically, we go from here to here. The very earliest burial is a woman. And then from the woman, everything else sort of starts. And for example, from a woman, we look at this situation here. She had a daughter and she had maybe a child that died as an infant. Could have been a daughter, could have been a son. We don't know because at a young age, you can determine a person's biological sex <clears throat> by just looking at their bones. You can only do that when they grow up, when they go past puberty. So for example, she had a daughter. Then that daughter had children. Uh, 
looks like there are three children. Again, we don't know their sex and one male. So it looks like it's a situation where she had no daughters that grew up to the adulthood to the point where they could have daughters of their own. So she probably used her son as a, uh, you know, as a person who sort of passed on her last name, so to speak. Uh, and therefore this person was included in this family cemetery. So that's kind of the, you know, the logic that they're using, you know, we don't know, there could be other scenarios that could account for this kind of tree. And, you know, there could be pos a possibility that it was a patrilineal society. But when we put everything together, the evidence overwhelmingly sort of you know, suggests that it was probably a matrilineal society, matrilineal, although that's harder to prove than the matrilocal. Like a matrilocal, that's uh, pretty clear, but a matrilineal, an argument can be made, but it's not as solid And this kind of lineage, you know, here we're talking about sort of last names, you know, that, that's difficult to prove by just looking at the material evidence, but, you know, material evidence usually suggests one or the other, like we will find out in one of the later cases. I said we're getting into physical anthropology a little bit, so let me bring up some slides to actually show you guys what uh, Ulrich found. Uh, give me just one second. Okay, let's start with the first one. So he's talking about, uh, you know, again, not metric traits. We've discussed the last time what it is. These are these minor anomalies that are passed on genetically. So the first one, let me maximize the slide just to show you guys uh, a little bit better. So the first one is called uh, metopism. Let me... Uh, make my cursor visible here. Okay, metopism. So I don't know if you guys know this or not, but on our skull, we have what's called sutures. Shvi, right, sutures. We have these different sutures. Uh, coronal suture, metopic suture, squamosal suture, and there are a couple of other ones in the back there. Sagittal suture that you can't really see. And so these sutures, we all have them. And at a certain age, they fuse together. When we're born, um, these sutures are visible and they're not fused together. Then when we grow older, they fuse together and our skull becomes harder and harder. Some of them never fuse. And they fuse at a different age and stuff like that. So this suture, this called metopic suture, it's also called frontal suture sometimes. It's supposed to fuse at about from one to eight years old. So when you're a little child, that thing is supposed to fuse and it's supposed to look like this. This is a normal skull here. Yeah, this is a normal skull. And as you can see, we can't even see any traces of this metopic suture, it's completely fused. This is a person with what's called metopism. It's not an illness. You won't like get headaches or anything from this. Uh, you won't feel it. You won't even know it. But some people have it, some people don't. It's considered sort of this minor anomaly. And so that's one of the non-metric traits that Ulrich looked at. And he found that some people had metopism basically when this metopic suture fails to fuse at the appropriate age and it stays unfused through later time phases, uh, later life phases. So that was one of them. Um, the other that Tatiana discussed uh, that she mentioned rather is uh, sutural ossicles. Again, here we're dealing with sutures Shui, right, like I said, and this is a view from the top, like this is the back of your head, this is the front of your head, okay, and we're looking at, uh, at a skull from the top. Again, we see these sutures, 
sutural ossicles. So this is a person with sutural ossicles here. This is basically like irregular uh, sutures, irregular fusion of your sutures. And it's pretty apparent here, right? That your suture is supposed to be kind of straight like that. And this person's suture is like all over the place. So these extra kind of areas are called sutural ossicles, okay? Uh, so that's the second non-metric trait that Ulrich looked at. The third one uh, should be pretty clear. Uh, these are also called wisdom teeth, our third molars. So every tooth in your mouth, as you probably know, has a name. And uh, the very last uh, set of teeth, uh, they're also called wisdom teeth. Some people have them, some people don't. Maybe some of you have them, some of you don't. Like, you know, at a different age, they pop up. Some may not pop up. It just varies from person to person. And so turns out that this thing is genetic also. So for example, if in, in your mouth, you know, your wisdom teeth never popped, uh, there is a high chance that this is genetic. That like, if you look at your parents and grandparents, uh, their wisdom teeth never grew also. So this is the third non-metric trait. It's the missing third molar. So it's the missing wisdom tooth. So this is what, uh, these are the three non-metric traits that he mentions. Then he says there are a couple of other ones, but we don't know what they are because he never mentions them. So let's move on to the next question. Um, let's see, Yana, can you read that one for us and try to answer it? Um, skeletons with what traits clustered within the cemetery and how exactly did they cluster? Okay, so can we answer that one? So clustering, right, is just occurring together in groups. So among these three traits that we discussed, um, people with what trait seem to cluster together? What does the text say? And that should be on page 112 in the right column, first paragraph. Page 112, right column, first paragraph, I believe, is when uh, he talks about how, this, how these traits were distributed through the cemetery. Was it metaphysm? Yes, okay, good. So it was metaphysm. And how exactly was this metaphysm distributed through the cemetery? Uh, what kind of clustering? Three clusters. Center, southern, and eastern parts. Perhaps corresponding to different families. So southern, eastern, that's two. And what's the third one? Central. Okay. That's good. And let me show you guys, I mean, this is an illustration from your book, uh, from your reading. So here are our graves from Ulrich's site. The ones that are dark have metaphysm and the ones that are light have no metaphysm. So when he looked at all the skeletons, he said, look, these ones have metaphysm. These ones have metaphysm. This one has metaphysm. And these ones too. <clears throat> so he saw three clusters in this, three distinct clusters. I guess that would look something like this. If you drew circles around these clusters, I guess this one is kind of outside of a cluster. You know, uh, this is like an outlier, <clears throat> but the rest of them form these three distinct groups. Uh, the Eastern, Central, and Southern, I guess. Okay, 
<clears throat> so question number four, um, Vlad, can you read that one, please? Sure, so. Okay. Uh, what was U U Ulrich conclusion? Okay. So from looking at this evidence that I've shown you, what did Ulrich conclude? What was his uh, conclusion about the site? <clears throat> so so what that, mm -hmm. mm, that there are there were several key groupings buried in different locations. Mm -hmm. So this all actually he but uh, what patterns he didn't explain. So oh well, actually in this picture we can see pattern. Mm. Yeah, okay, so he said there are three kin groups, which is kind of obvious, right? We saw that. So w what else does he say just more about the kind of organization of this society? Does he say any more sort of general things besides this fact that there are three kin groups? And that's a question for everyone. Is there any more sort of general information about the, I guess, organization of the society? I mean, which is kind of an obvious continuation of what we've just said. <clears throat> so I, I guess what, what he's saying what I'm trying to get at is he's saying, okay, kinship is the organizing principle of this society, right? That it's a society that's sort of focused on kinship, which is not sort of a groundbreaking conclusion, but um, not all societies are very focused on kinship, right? So for example, when we move uh, forward, through sort of social evolution, so to speak, right? And when we look at societies with greater levels of complexity, for example, the organizing principles, they veer away from kinship. So for example, your occupation can be your main identity within that society. Like if you live in a village or if you live in a city, <clears throat> like what we see in early towns and early cities, uh, occupation, plays a great role. So for example, all metal smiths, right? Like people who work with metal, they start living in one section of a town. And when we look at the cemetery, the cemetery is grouped based on uh, their craft activity. So for example, all people who make pots may be buried in one part of the cemetery with their pottery implements. All people who work with metal they're buried in another part of the cemetery with their metal working tools and stuff like that. Um, you know, besides occupation or, or your, you know, craft specialization, there could be other organizing principles in the society like, uh, you know, religion, for example. So if we look at a cemetery, we see clusters, not necessarily based on kinship, although they, they may coincide, it may not, but based on religious identity. So like one section of the cemetery could be, you know, religion A, the other section could be religion B, or even within one religion, we may see people who are priests buried in a separate section of a cemetery or just buried in a separate cemetery altogether. And they're not genetically related, but them occupying that priest, uh, occupation, I guess, you know, that's the main sort of determining part of their identity. Uh, social class could be a part of your identity. Again, that is related to kinship, but not necessarily. So rich people could be buried in one section, poor people could be buried in another section of a cemetery. And sometimes it's not genetically inherited, right? So people could become rich within a matter of one generation. So 
this organizing principle, what Ulrich is saying is, you know, it was kinship, but it could have been not necessarily so. Okay, uh, so it's an obvious kind of conclusion from from the first glance, but when you start kind of thinking about it, uh, we can't just assume that in the society, kinship was the organizing principle. Uh, it could have been otherwise. So <clears throat> let's move on to question number five. Uh, Julia, can you read that one for us? Um. How reliable are non-metric traits for kinship identification, statistically speaking? Okay, so let's try to answer that. Either Julia or someone else. Uh, what does Mays say about this? And that uh, the answer is we're still on page 112 in the right column in the second paragraph there is this long paragraph so try to read that and see what he what he actually says in terms of numbers what do the statistics show you know like things like metapism things like uh, sutural ossicles like in general when we take all non-metric traits missing third molars and there are close to 400 of them all together so knowing what we know from modern data, you know, when we looked at people who we know are genetically related and measured their, not measured, but recorded their non-metric traits, do we get any kind of statistical conclusion about how reliable or not reliable non-metric traits are? So try to try to extract that information from the text again, page 112, right column, second paragraph. And look for numbers, you know, does he give any, any numbers there? Does he say, you know, one in 10 or one in a hundred? Uh, yes, Julia. Um, so he says that uh, genetic control over variants is generally thought to be fairly weak um, because in the studies re re referred to above on uh, human subjects, first degree relatives of individuals uh, showing a particular trait showed a frequency of the trait that was at most about six times greater than the general population. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so here's what he means, right? If we look, let me show you guys the slide here to, to make it more clear, hopefully. Okay, give me just one second. Okay, so Here's that slide. So hopefully you can read it. So for example, <clears throat> if we take just random 10 people from the street and see if they have metapism, let's say one in 10 people will have metapism. But if these 10 people that we take are all first degree relatives, first degree, like, you know, mother, daughter, granddaughter, this is like first degree, brother, sister, like immediate family, first degree relatives, then six in 10 people will have metapism. So this is what he means, where, you know, when he says that it's six times more prevalent in first degree relatives than in just random people. So these are the kind of statistics that we're looking at and he calls that a fairly weak relationship. 
you know, so overall these non-metric traits, they suggest something, but not necessarily, you know, it's not like a hundred percent proof. So for example, if I find two people with metopism in a cemetery, I can't really say that, okay, this is the son of this man because they both have metopism. I will need to talk statistically speaking then, you know, there is this blah, blah, blah possibility, you know, like 30% possibility or whatever it is, you know, we'll need to do some math here that this, this young man is this old man's son, right? So this is the kind of, uh, you know, reliability we're looking at here. And then, um, again, I encourage you guys to look at these illustrations that will clarify a lot of things for you when you do the reading. So these are the three clusters that he identified. So let me make my cursor visible. Give me just one second. So like this would be cluster one here. This would be cluster two. And this would be cluster three. You know, the clusters two and three are denoted by different colors. So you can sort of see how there was probably a circular structure here around which, or semicircular structure around which this cluster of graves formed. Here you can see it very well, perfectly, that there is this empty circle in the middle of the graves. So there must have been something circular around which these graves formed. Here it's not so obvious. I don't see a circular structure or semicircular. I mean, maybe here you can make out like a semicircle or maybe here is what he means, but not so clear. But this cluster is definitely set off spatially from the others. So it just forms a natural cluster. You know, it's obvious that it's a different grouping to where these two is not so obvious, um, you know, like this grave, does it belong to cluster two or cluster three? But, you know, we'll sort of trust uh, Bondioli and his colleagues because they have more information on the site and we don't know everything that was going on. Maybe there was some obvious, uh, you know, other lines of evidence that we don't see. Like, for example, maybe they found pulse holes from a fence that went from here to here. And that's why they're confident that this grave belongs to cluster three and not cluster two. So we'll just sort of uh, uh, leave that there. Um, okay, so three clusters. And uh, the thing is that Bondioli et al, or, you know, this is a Latin term for colleagues, Bondioli and colleagues, they were not the first ones who hypothesized about the existence of three clusters. So this site was excavated before and basically uh, older archeologists, they already thought that there were three clusters of graves and that these three clusters of graves were probably organized by kinship principles, by principles of uh, blood descent, by principles of lineages and stuff like that. And so Bondioli, what they did as opposed to Ulrich taking every individual grave, right? And looking for metopism and non-metric traits in every individual grave, and then seeing if they have clusters, they already approach this problem by comparing, uh, they already have clusters. And what they do, they compare not individual graves, but they, they compare three clusters. They take graves from this cluster and treat it as sort of one batch of numbers. They take graves from this cluster and treat it as batch two. And they take this cluster and treat it as batch three. And so they start comparing the batches, the groups between each other. And what that does, it uh, makes things easier statistically. Because if you, you know, try to look at every individual grave according to every individual non-metric trait, your numbers will just be out of control and it will be very difficult to find patterns. Uh, but when you compare clusters, it's a more manageable task and this is what they do. So uh, let's read the next question and try to answer it. Uh, Tatiana, can you read that one? It's nine, yeah. number nine. Okay. 
So number nine is how many skeletons according to how many non-metric traits did Bondioli et al. analyze? 89. 89 what? 89 male skeletons. Yeah, 89 skeletons. And according to how many traits, non-metric traits? Uh, 27. Okay. So looks, you know, like it, there are 89 graves here altogether. And there are 27 non-metric traits. So you can only imagine sort of the statistical kind of robusticity that's going on here, right? The statistical challenge. So, so this is what they did. And again, they did it by groupings. Uh, so this is kind of... Uh, you know, more robust data than what we were looking at before. So it, at any rate, so let's read number 10. Uh, Vlad, can you read that one? Uh, what ends in that did Bandioli at all find? So they find the five, uh, how to say, five, five frequencies of uh, non, this non metric trace in three, in these three clusters. So they find that males, especially males, have uh, this non-metric traits different, and they have in, say, five base maybe, no. But they was divided in that, according to what non-metric traits they had. Mm -hmm. And also they find that w women, uh, uh, women they didn't have uh, non-metric traits some some pattern and the same is if they didn't have the same uh, non-metric traits uh, as mine had mm -hmm. okay so um, thank you let me clarify this a little bit so what they said is that out of 27 non-metric traits five varied significantly from one cluster to the other, or I guess between three clusters. So for example, if we take one non-metric trait like metopism, let's say in this cluster of graves, only one person had metopism. And in this cluster of grave, 10 people had metopism, right? So even though both clusters had metopism, this difference is statistically significant, okay? Like one out of this many graves versus like eight or 10 out of this many graves. So there is a statistical confidence that there is a difference between these two clusters in regards to this one trait, to metopism. If we take the second trait, for example, third missing molar, if there are, you know, two third missing molars, in this grouping, but there are 20 people with missing molars in this uh, cluster. Also, that's a statistically significant difference. And, you know, there are, of course, numbers to accompany that. I'm just sort of making up numbers here, but you guys see the point that, um, you know, that's an example of when, according to one trait, these two clusters showed a statistically significant difference. If there is only two instances in a bunch of graves versus 20 instances in like almost every grave has third missing molar, we can speak about this trait being statistically significant between these two groups. And so this is the kind of logic that was applied here and three clusters, you know, I give you an example of two clusters, but three clusters were compared and they saw that five traits showed a significant difference, five traits. And what they say is that if it was only one trait, so for example, metopism, we could not conclude anything about the kinship difference between these clusters. But when we see five traits varying significantly between these three clusters, there is no way that it could be a random coincidence. So for example, if we saw that out of 27 traits, these clusters differed by, differed by only one trait, like metopism, we wouldn't be very confident in the fact that we're looking at three 
uh, distinct kinship groups. But when they vary by five, what they're saying, it's impossible for this to be a random coincidence. They have to be related to biological genetical kinship. So this is their data. This is what they saw in data. And what they saw is that in males, they saw this variation based on five non-metric traits. But in females, they only saw one non-metric trait varying. And so they're saying that since it's only one non-metric trait, that could be just a, a random event. It could be a result of just, uh, you know, of not kinship relatedness. But when we see five traits, that's kinship. And so what they're saying is that males in these graves uh, are grouped by kinship principles. So this is, let's say, one you know, family, one last name or whatever, one group of people related genetically. This is the second group of people related genetically. And this is the third group of people related genetically, but only males are related genetically and the females are not, okay? And that moves us to the next question. Let's see, uh, Julia, can you read that one please? Number 11. Uh, what did Bondioli uh, conclude? Yeah, so what's the conclusion in more sort of social terms, right? Not in terms of just bones and, and statistics, but in terms of uh, how the society was organized. So um, based on this finding, uh, he concluded that uh, the burial clusters at uh, this place um, being patrilocal kin groups. Yeah. Just like the last time we looked at uh, Hawk Phantom D cemetery, and this time we're looking at uh, the cemetery in uh, Italy, um, but it's a mirror image, right? That basically males are all genetically related and this is not one generation of males, right? These are over at least a few generations. I mean, we don't have the data, but you know, it's very rare that it's some kind of a cemetery where it was like a one-time event. <clears throat> this happened over many generations. All of the males are re related to one another, meaning they did not leave the village. So all of the males remained in the village while women came from the outside. So like a young man, when he comes of age, he marries a woman and that woman who is not genetically related to them moves to their village. And then, you know, she becomes of that, of that a part of that lineage and is buried in the cemetery. That's why we see these women who are kind of from the outside, who have no relation to the males. So this was definitely a patri local society, right? A society where after marriage, people lived in the husband's, in the groom's village, not in the wife's village. So hopefully that's pretty clear. And um, one thing that uh, we did not mention are the metric traits, right? We've been talking about non-metric traits. What does um, Maze, or I guess what did uh, Bondioli and colleagues say about metric traits, the traits that you can actually measure? And that's also in that, uh, should be in one of the last paragraphs of your reading. on page 114 and uh, I guess the end of the second paragraph. He should be mentioning metric traits there somewhere or in the second paragraph. Yes, Yana. Yes. Um 
so these measurements resembled those from, from the non-metric variants in showing great between group differences for males. Okay, so um, remember the traits we talked about so far are non-metric, meaning you don't measure them. Like metopism, you don't measure width of the gap between the bones of your skull, right? You don't say it's two millimeters, three millimeters. You just say it's either present or absent. So it's an, that's why it's called non-metric. But uh, they're also metric traits, right? These are traits that you actually measure with a ruler, right? And these are not really traits, but just metric characteristics of the bones, just the metrics, right? So they also measured, um, cranial bones, postcranial bones, cranial meaning your head, your skull, and postcranial is everything that's below your skull. So they measured long bones, right? Like maybe the bone of your, of your arm, measured all kinds of bones. And they also found that there is a statistical difference between the clusters in the measured, uh, in the measured bone sense, right? So for example, I'm just giving you a rough example here. These men were on average 10 centimeters taller than these men. Okay, that's an example of a metric, even though, you know, they probably didn't measure the height directly because a lot of times we have these bones that are fragmented and, uh, you know, but by measuring the long bones, you can then project a person's height, right? If you measure their, the separate bones of their legs and stuff like that, uh, or if you have an entire skeleton, you can definitely measure its height. Um, so that's an example of a metric trait. Or maybe, you know, they measured uh, the circumference of the skull. For example, like people here, their heads were five centimeters bigger in diameter on average than the heads of these men. This kind of stuff also suggests kinship. This kind of stuff also suggests genetic descent. Again, not necessarily, again, there are some statistics here, some disclaimers, right? Because the height is a difficult kind of uh, thing to talk about being passed on genetically, right? If I just had two skeletons and both of them are tall, I can't really say that one is the son of the other, but when I work with these groups and I can see, okay, this group is 10 centimeters on average taller than this group of men, and this group is like five centimeters shorter than this group, and if my statistical tests tell me that it's a relationship that we can be confident in, then it just adds to my conclusion. It adds to my confidence that I am in fact looking at three different kinship groups. And this is what happened here. So their non-metric trait evidence was nicely supported by the metric evidence also. We just don't know the details of the metric evidence. You know, we would need to read the actual article by Bondioli. We're just reading the short summary of it, you know, in two paragraphs provided to us by uh, by Mays, uh, but this is this is what happened.